sure.
this is a state has made a motion that's been assented to by the defense to restrict access to some of the exhibits, one in particular that's at issue this morning, and I'm saying this for all of the public, but particularly for the media, who I know is here today, yes, that there's one particular exhibit, exhibit number three, that I am granting a motion that that exhibit not be recorded or photographed or displayed in any way on the internet. It's available for public inspection if you want to look at it, but it can't be, you know, copied, videoed, photographed, broadcast on the internet. Understood? Anyone? Okay, yes, so we'll, okay, thank you, and okay, yes, Good morning. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is the matter of the state versus John DeLay. I'm going to ask that we start with an oath for the jurors. Would you all please stand and raise your right hand and keep it raised during the oath that Mr. DeLay, would you please stand and face the jury and remain standing. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will carefully consider the evidence and the law presented to you in this case and that you will deliver a fair and true verdict as to the charges against the defendant, so help you God. Thank you. Members of the jury may be seated. Please listen to reading of the three indictments. Our docket number is 23CR147. The first indictment ending in 410C states as follows, that the grand jurors for the state of New Hampshire, upon their oath, present that John DeLay of or formerly of Salem, New Hampshire, in the state of New Hampshire, on or about January 28th, 2023, at Manchester in Hillsborough County, with force and arms, did commit the crime of second degree murder, and that John DeLay did recklessly cause the death of Timothy Puglio under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to the value of human life by shooting Timothy Puglio, said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. The second indictment ending in charge ID number 962C alleges that John DeLay of or formerly of Salem, New Hampshire, on or about January 28th at Manchester in the county of Hillsborough, aforesaid, with force and arms, did commit the crime of second degree murder in that John DeLay did knowingly cause the death of Timothy Puglio by shooting Timothy Puglio, said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. And the third indictment, which ends in charge ID number 411C, states as follows, that John DeLay of or formerly of Salem, New Hampshire, in the state of New Hampshire, on or about January 28th, 2023, at Manchester, in the county of Hillsborough, aforesaid, with force and arms, did commit the crime of reckless conduct, recklessly engage in conduct which placed or may have placed another in danger of serious bodily injury by means of a deadly weapon, by firing a pistol multiple times in proximity to occupied motor vehicles and or pedestrians, said acts being contrary to the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace and dignity of the state. 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant, John DeLay, has been arraigned on these charges and has pled not guilty. And of this, he puts himself upon his country for trial, which country you are. The assistant attorneys general, Scott Chase and Rachel Harrington, have joined the issue. And you're to say by your verdicts if the defendant, John DeLay, is guilty of the offenses whereof he stands charged or not guilty. Hearken to the evidence. Okay. So as I uh, explained to you, or I told you just before we broke for the lunch break, I um, start, my practice is to start the trial with some of the principles of law that you need to understand in deciding this case. Uh, and these are issues that tend not to change from case to case, and I, I think are helpful for the jury to have in mind as you're listening to a trial unfold. And then at the end of the case, I will give you additional instructions, which will include uh, the definition of the crimes that are charged and any other issues that come up during the course of the trial. And so I'm not going to repeat the instructions I'm giving you now again at the end of the case, but I do give the jury a complete copy of the written instructions to have back with you in uh, deliberations. So in order to reach a fair and just verdict, you have to understand and follow the law as I give it to you. So as I said, you have to understand the definition of the crime or crimes with which the defendant is charged. You have to understand how convinced one way or another you need to be, and you have to understand what to consider in deciding whether to believe a particular witness. So these instructions will address these and other issues so that you can reach a fair and just verdict in the case. Um, now, it's up to you to decide the facts of the case. You and you alone decide those facts. You, take, you decide those facts based on the evidence that's presented during the course of the trial. When you take the facts as you determine them to be, you apply them to the law as I give it to you in the instructions, and it's in that way that you reach your verdict in the case. And you should decide those facts without fear, without prejudice, and without sympathy. As I said, you decide the facts based on evidence uh, during the course of the trial, and the most common forms of evidence are um, the testimony of witnesses will come here to court and testify under oath subject to direct and cross-examination. Uh, there'll, there'll be exhibits that will be marked. Um, those might be things like photographs or uh, ob maybe even tangible objects that are marked. Um, and we'll also have a view as a form of evidence. I'll give you some instructions about that momentarily. And so all of that will uh, be You'll, will be available for you to consider as evidence in deciding the facts of the case. There are those certain matters that you're not allowed to consider as evidence in deciding the case. So the fact that the defendant has been arrested and charged with a crime is not evidence of his guilt. And just a moment ago, you heard the clerk read to you the indictments in the case. Those are also not evidence. Uh, an indictment is simply a way of giving a defendant notice of the accusations against him. In other words, it's a formal way of accusing a person of a crime so that he can be brought to stand trial. So in your deliberations, you're not allowed to consider the fact of the defendant's arrest, the indictments, or that he's being brought to stand trial as evidence of his guilt. Also, the possible punishment the defendant may receive if you do find that the state has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt should not factor into your deliberations in any way. Um, in New Hampshire, the jury does not play a role in sentencing that is uh, exclusively the province of the judge. So you should not discuss any issues with respect to sentencing or punishment in determining the outcome of this case. Uh, so when I'm done um, with these instructions in a couple of minutes, you are going to hear from the lawyers as they address you in the opening statements. You'll hear from the lawyers throughout the trial as they question witnesses and then at the end of the case, the lawyers will stand up and address you again directly in the closing arguments. What's important to keep in mind that what the lawyers say throughout this trial is not evidence. They aren't witnesses. They can't testify about what happened. Um, the purpose of an opening statement is it gives each side an opportunity to give you a, an outline or a roadmap about what each side thinks the evidence is going to demonstrate during the trial so that as you're listening, to a case unfold, you have some idea about how different pieces fit into the bigger picture from each side's point of view. And then the purpose of a closing argument at the end of the case is it gives each side an opportunity to summarize for you what the lawyers believe the evidence demonstrated during the course of the trial, and also to argue to you how they think that evidence fits with the law as I give it to you in the instructions. So if the lawyers describe the, law, the evidence differently from the evidence that you perceive during the course of the trial, then you need to rely on your own memory and perception of that evidence and disregard how the lawyers are describing the evidence. 
And likewise, if the lawyers describe the law differently from the law as I give it to you, you need to apply the law as I've given it to you and disregard how the lawyers are describing the law. Uh, so during the course of the trial, there are uh, very likely going to be objections. We probably all have seen this on TV or in the movies. Um, as I explained to you earlier this morning, uh, we have rules of evidence and rules of procedure that are designed to make sure the process is fair to both sides. So that if one side or the other thinks that certain evidence shouldn't be considered under, under those rules, that side's responsibility is to object and uh, I need to rule on those objections. So don't hold it against either side if there are objections in the case, the lawyers are simply doing their job. You need to decide the case based only on the evidence that's properly admitted. So what that means is if I sustain an objection, in other words, I rule that a witness is not allowed to answer a question or, a, or I rule that a certain exhibit is not allowed to be admitted as a full exhibit, you, you're not allowed to speculate about what that answer may have been or what that exhibit may have shown. So as I said, you need to decide the evidence based on, uh, decide the facts based on evidence properly admitted. On the other hand, if I overrule an objection and I allow the witness to answer or I allow an exhibit to be marked as a full exhibit, don't put any special weight on that ruling. I don't make rulings on objections based on the importance of the evidence to the outcome. I'm simply applying the rules to the circumstances as they're presented to me. Now, it is my job to be fair and impartial uh, throughout this trial, just as you all are required to be fair and impartial. So if I say or do anything during the course of the trial that makes you think I favor one side or the other in this case, I do not. My job is to run this trial in an orderly fashion, to rule on objections as they're presented, and uh, to instruct you on the law that applies to the case. It's you and you alone who determine the verdict in this case. All right, so now that I've talked to you about what you're not allowed to consider, uh, let, me t let me discuss with you what you uh, can consider as evidence. So uh, first, as I mentioned, uh, we're gonna have a view in this case, or not first, but we're gonna have a view in this case. Um, that's gonna happen tomorrow morning first thing. So you'll all come here uh, for 10 o'clock, and we're not gonna convene again in the courtroom, so I'm not gonna give you any additional instructions at that point, uh, but you'll, once we know everybody's here, all the jurors are here, and we have everybody ready to go, you'll get on a bus, we'll head over to the location where some of the events that you'll hear about during the course of the trial are um, alleged to have occurred. And so um, the, a view is uh, a form of evidence that is, um, you know, not physically, we can't physically bring it into court, but it's every bit as much evidence as anything that happens here in this courtroom. So um, the purpose of a view is twofold. First off, it is to give you an opportunity uh, to have a general understanding of the scene of the charged events and what uh, where the events are alleged to have occurred. So be sure to look over the scene as a whole and understand um, different objects and locations relative to one another and the landmarks at issue in the case. Um, the, the second thing that happens on a view is the lawyers can point out to you certain things they think you might hear about during the course of the trial, um, and that might help you in focusing on different parts of the scene that you're about to see, so that as you're listening to testimony unfold, you have some understanding of where that fits in. Um, so, uh, so what, uh, as I said, um, the view itself is evidence for you to consider, but what the lawyers say on the view is not evidence any more than anything else that happens uh, during the course of the trial. That, that what the lawyers are doing, much like in an opening statement or in asking witnesses questions, is simply guiding uh, your attention to certain issues they think are important in the case. Um, so once we're out on the view, don't take any kind of measurements or pace off anything. Uh, at the scene. Just get a general perspective of the layout and the location of different objects and different locations uh, at that scene. If s precise measurements are relevant or important to the outcome of the case or the lawyers think that information is, needs to be presented to you, that's information that'll be presented during the course of the trial. So, um, so, so don't do any kind of measurements on your own at the scene. Uh, it's also important to keep in mind that you can't return to the scene. So it's low, it's close to here, um, but do not visit it again during the course of this trial. Um, 
I know the way you may arrive here, you may drive past the location, but um, the, the reality is you're not allowed to stop there and visit again. So take as much time as you need to when we're out there tomorrow to see and, and observe what you think um, you might so that you can form a mental picture of that location. Um, but you're not allowed to return there on their own and on your own uh, during the trial, and we won't return there at any point after that. Um, and so what happens on The View is every bit as much a formal part of this trial process as what happens here in the courtroom. So as a result, the lawyers aren't going to be able to engage you in small talk or banter. Uh, and I also won't be able to do that. Um, and you also aren't going to be able to ask questions on The View. So uh, you are, you, uh, that being said though, if you have any difficulty hearing or seeing anything that uh, occurs on The View, do let me know or the bailiffs know. You know, it's often hard, particularly in an outdoor location, uh, voices don't carry as well. So, you know, because you'll probably be spread out a little bit, if anyone's having any difficulty hearing or seeing, just let me know. That's something we need to make sure that you have plenty of um, opportunity to do. Again, and that's just like here in the courtroom. If you're having any difficulty during the court trial itself, seeing or hearing something, you know, wave your hand, get my attention. We'll make adjustments to make sure uh, that you see and hear everything okay. So we should do the same thing out on the view. Um, so in addition to the view, uh, there'll be testimony of witnesses, as I mentioned, um, and uh, evidence and, and uh, that will be introduced during the course of the trial. So again, you need to decide the case and the facts of the case based on only the legally admissible evidence and any reasonable inferences that you can draw from that evidence. So what I mean by reasonable inferences are those conclusions which reason and common sense would have you draw from facts that are proven to your satisfaction. So there are two ways a party can prove a fact in a case. A party can prove a fact either through direct evidence or through circumstantial evidence. So direct evidence is the direct proof of a fact uh, the easiest example to think about is you have an eyewitness comes to court, describes to you what that person personally observed based on their own on their own senses. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence that tends to prove a disputed fact through the use of other facts. So circumstantial evidence is the proof of a chain of facts and circumstances that tend to prove whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. So let me just give you an example to make this a little uh, more concrete. So let's assume that you uh, came to court today and it was completely overcast, but it was not raining outside. And you're sitting here in court and you see somebody come through the doors. That person is, um, or, uh, the person's wearing rubber boots, has a raincoat on, is closing an umbrella and is soaking wet. So if you were in a room where you could look out the window and see that it's raining right now, that's obviously direct evidence of what the weather is. But if you were in a room without windows to the outdoor, then you could consider all the facts and circumstances known to you, condition of the weather when you entered the courtroom, your observations of the person entering the courthouse, um, your common sense, your everyday life experience, and you put all that together and you determine whether you believe it's raining outside even though there's no direct evidence of that. So that's an example of circumstantial evidence. And you should consider both, si both types of evidence in deciding this case, both direct and circumstantial. There is no legal distinction between the weight to be given either direct or circumstantial evidence. It's up to you, the jury, how much weight to give any evidence, whether it's direct or circumstantial. There is, though, a rule about circumstantial evidence that you need to apply in criminal cases. So if the state presents only circumstantial evidence to prove any one or more elements of a crime charged, that in order to convict, you must be convinced from the totality of the evidence that all reasonable conclusions other than guilt have been excluded. So what does that mean? If from the circumstantial evidence, it's reasonable to arrive at two conclusions, one consistent with guilt and one consistent with innocence, you must choose the reasonable conclusion consistent with innocence. But in making that decision about whether all reasonable conclusions other than guilt have been excluded, don't focus on any particular item of circumstantial evidence in isolation. Consider all the evidence in the case, both direct and circumstantial, in determining if the state has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Also keep in mind that this rule about circumstantial evidence does not apply to direct evidence. So if there's a conflict between 
two or more witnesses who offer direct evidence, then you have to resolve that conflict and try to determine what the truth is. So um, let me again give you another example to make this concrete. Let's assume that you had a case where you have two witnesses take the stand. First witness testifies, I was present for the events charged in this case and I observed the defendant commit the crime. Second witness takes the witness stand and says, I was present for the events charged in this case and I saw the defendant did not commit this crime. So there you have two witnesses both offering direct evidence directly contrary to one another. In that situation, you don't have to automatically accept the testimony of the witness consistent with innocence. You have to try to resolve the conflict between that witness, those witnesses' testimonies and determine what the truth is. And likewise, if you have only one witness who offers direct evidence, you have to decide if you believe that testimony and if that testimony together with any other evidence in the case proves uh, the element or elements of a charge beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, so in reviewing the evidence, keep in mind what's important is the quality of the evidence, not the quantity. So it doesn't necessarily matter how many witnesses testify or how many exhibits are marked in a particular case. It's the quality of the evidence that should be your focus. So in other words, how persuasive is that evidence to you in deciding whether the state has proven uh, the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt? So, as I indicated uh, just now, if there's a conflict between witness testimony, you're going to have to resolve that conflict. So, in other words, you're going to have to determine the credibility of witnesses. Um, simply because a witness takes the witness stand and takes an oath to tell the truth does not mean you have to accept that testimony as true. Um, use your common sense and your uh, everyday life experience. Again, these are all decisions we make in our day-to-day -day lives, and you should apply those same skills and judgments you do in your ordinary life to the uh, evidence presented during the course of this trial. So I'll suggest some factors, though, that may be helpful for you to think about as you're uh, considering the credibility of the witnesses who testify. So consider the following factors. A witness's appearance, attitude, and behavior on the stand and the way the witness testifies. Consider a witness's age, intelligence, and experience. Consider the witness's ability, uh, opportunity and ability to see and hear the things about which the witness is testifying. Consider the accuracy of the witness's memory. Consider whether the witness has any motive for not telling the truth. Consider whether the witness has any interest in the outcome of the case. Consider any bias the witness may have or any friendship or any animosity that witness may have either for or against any people involved in this case. Consider the consistency or the inconsistency in the witness's testimony. Also consider what the, what the witness says appears reasonable or unreasonable. And consider whether what the witness said is either consistent or inconsistent with the testimony of other witnesses or with statements that witness has made at another time. So in deciding which witnesses to believe and how much of their testimony to believe, consider also both the direct and the cross-examination. So if you believe that part of a witness's testimony is false, you can choose to distrust other parts, but again, you're not required to do so. Inconsistencies and contradictions within a witness's testimony or even between witnesses doesn't necessarily mean you should disbelieve a witness. It's possible for two honest people to witness or experience the same event differently. So you should um, evaluate and, co and consider inconsistencies and contradictions and determine whether they relate to important or unimportant issues. You don't need to believe a witness's testimony even if that testimony is uncontradicted. You're also not required to accept testimony as true simply because some or even all of the witnesses agree with one another. You can find the testimony of one witness or of a few witnesses more persuasive than the testimony of the larger number. <coughs> Now, in this case, you're going to also hear uh, testimony from one or more witnesses who testify as an expert witness based on special training, education, skills, or knowledge. And so when a case involves a matter that is involves that special knowledge or skill that is not ordinarily possessed by the average person, then an expert is permitted to state his or her opinion uh, for the information and the assistance of the jury. So the opinions that are stated by an expert who testify are going to be based either on particular facts as the expert himself or herself observed, or that the expert learned from others, or that the lawyers who question the expert ask that expert to assume. So you can reject an expert's opinion if you decide that the facts 
uh, that form the basis of the opinion are uh, different from the facts in the case, or whether, if you determine that the expert's opinion is based on misinformation, or if you determine that the expert lacks qualifications to render a reliable opinion. You can also consider whether or not the expert took advantage of an opportunity to make a thorough investigation before rendering an opinion. And you can reject the opinion if, after careful consideration of all of the evidence in the case, whether it's expert testimony or otherwise, you disagree with that opinion. So in other words, um, expert opinion is uh, given to you to assist you. It is not binding on you. Um, it can be considered by you as any other evidence in the case. Now, uh, as the lawyers question experts, they may ask an expert to assume certain facts to be true. That's called what we call a hypothetical question. And so um, if the um, it's up to you to determine whether the facts that are form the basis of that hypothetical question are in fact proven. So if um, you determine that the facts that form the basis for the hypothetical have not been proven, then you should disregard any opinion offered by the expert based on that hypothetical question. Uh, on the other hand, if you find that the facts that have been assumed have been established by the evidence, then that is that the facts are prob more probably true than not, then you can consider that opinion and give it the weight you think it deserves. Um, so expert testimony, as I said before, as with any other testimony, you can accept all of it, you can reject all of it, or you can accept some of it and reject some of it. Again, that's an, a decision entirely up to you, the jury. And um, the principles that I've outlined about judging credibility of witnesses apply to every single witness in the case, whether that person is an ordinary civilian, an expert witness, a police officer, or otherwise. So in short, consider the testimony of each witness and give it the weight you think it deserves. You can, uh, as I said, accept all of what a witness says, reject all of what a witness says, or accept some and reject some. All right, so now I've talked to you about what you're not allowed to consider and what you are allowed to consider. Let me discuss with you how convinced one way or another you need to be, and that's what we call the burden of proof. So under both the Constitution of the United States and New Hampshire's own Constitution, all defendants in criminal cases are presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And the burden of proving guilt rests entirely on the state. So the defendant uh, enters this courthouse as an innocent person and you have to consider him to be innocent until the state convinces you beyond, from the evidence, beyond a reasonable doubt that he is guilty of the crimes that he is charged. So if after all the evidence and arguments, you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the defendant committed any one or more elements of a crime charged, then you must find him not guilty. And ladies and gentlemen, that concept reasonable doubt is what the words ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It's a doubt based on reason. It's not a frivolous or a fanciful doubt or one easily explained away. Rather, it's such a doubt based on reason as remains after consideration of all of the evidence the state has offered against it. So the test you have to use is this. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proven any one or more elements of a crime charged, then you must find the defendant not guilty. But if you find that the state has proven all of the elements of a charge beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. Uh, a couple, couple other things before I turn it over to the lawyers in the opening statement. So um, I told you that you're not allowed to do any kind of outside research. One of the things, or do any kind of, uh, um, you know, look at anything outside the trial and deciding the case, um, there is, um, as some of you know, and I think it was alluded to in the uh, panel voir dire questions, has been uh, some media coverage of this case, and there's likely going to be uh, media coverage at different points throughout the trial. Uh, what's um, important for you to keep in mind is that the uh, media is not allowed to film or record any of the jurors at all, so don't wait, worry about that. You're not allowed to be uh, photographed or videoed at all during this process. Um, uh, but because there's likely to be media coverage during the course of the trial, 
Uh, it's important to make, take steps not to watch the news or to get the local paper. So for example, on my phone, I have an app and up comes the local um, headlines every morning. So if you need to turn that off, if you have something like that, or you routinely watch you know, the local news in the morning uh, or listen to it on the radio, just um, turn that off, refrain from doing that during the course of the trial so you're not exposed to anything uh, outside of this trial ex itself. Um, and um, last point I want to talk about is we will take breaks during the course of the trial to give you a chance to stretch your legs and use the restroom. Uh, and so, but if at any point during a trial you need to take a break, um, don't hesitate to get my opinion, uh, my attention or a bailiff's attention and ask to take a break. It's really not a big deal to take a break and I would very much rather take a break than having you distracted thinking about when the break's gonna be and not paying attention to what's happening. Um, so during the breaks, uh, feel free to talk to one another to get to know one another, but you're not allowed to talk about the case itself uh, as it's unfolding and that's a little counterintuitive. So I told you you're not allowed to talk to anyone else outside the uh, process, that's logical, but um, you know, it's human nature as you're listening to a case unfold to want to talk to one another and say, oh, what'd you think about that last witness? Or how do you think this is going? Or what do you think about this issue in the case? Um, the reason that's important not to do that is because if you, if you have those conversations as a case is unfolding, what it tends to do is cause you to form opinions in your mind about what you think the outcome ought to be. Um, and then it becomes hard to shape those opinions as they are formed. And so uh, cases have to unfold in a certain way. Um, because the state has the burden of proof, it presents evidence first. Uh, Mr. DeLee, because of the presumption of innocence, has no obligation to present any evidence in the case whatsoever, but he has a right to do so if he wanted to, and that wouldn't happen until after the state has rested its case. And even if uh, the defendant exercises his absolute constitutional right not to present any evidence in the case, the significance of the evidence that was presented during trial may not become clear to you until the final instructions and the lawyers stand up and argue to you in the closing arguments how it all fits together. So you may not get some very important pieces of information till very late in the trial process. So that's why it's important. Just keep an open mind, take it all in, and you'll have plenty of time to talk about these issues once you're back in deliberations at the end of the case. Okay, parties ready to proceed. Attorney Herring. Defendant John DeLee was angry. He wanted a fight, he demanded a fight, and he wasn't leaving that night until he got it. He demanded a fight inside the bar, telling Timmy Pouliot, let's go outside, let's go outside. He demanded a fight as he was leaving the bar, yelling, Come fucking fight me, come fight me, come fight me, as the bouncers were kicking him out. He demanded a fight out on the street, yelling back at the bar for someone to come outside and fight him. He demanded a fight further up the street when Timmy Pouliot's friend came over to talk and the defendant struck him in the face, not once, but twice. And he demanded a fight when he squared off with Timmy in the middle of Old Granite Street, surrounded by both of their friends. The defendant was angry, angry at Timmy Pouillot, and angry at Timmy's friends. He was looking to teach Timmy a lesson, but not with his fists. He was looking for a reason to use his gun and he got exactly what he asked for, exactly what he wanted. As the bars were letting out for the night in Manchester in the early morning hours of January 28th, 2023, as the streets were filling with people leaving to go home, the defendant, John DeLee, 
opened fire on Timmy Pouliot in the middle of Old Granite Street. He shot nine rounds directly at Timmy, striking him twice in the front, once in the side, and five times in the back, gunning him down in a street full of people, then turning and walking away. And he did this not out of fear, not out of necessity, but out of anger. This case is about rage, not fear. This case is about retribution, not protection. This case is about murder, not self-defense. Now let's back up for a moment and talk about what led up to the murder of Timmy Puglia. This all began at the Goat Bar and Grill in Manchester, and you will see this location on your view tomorrow. The road in front of the Goat is called Old Granite Street. And this is an overview of that area with the goat marked in red. Old Granite Street is a short street in downtown Manchester, and it contains several bars, including the goat. It's a place where people gather to go out on the weekend. And on the night of Friday, January 27th, 2023, the defendant went to the goat with his friends, Matthew Soldano and Gage Chandler. Now this is a floor plan of the interior of the goat and you will not be seeing the interior of the goat during your view, but you will be seeing this diagram during trial. So I wanna take a moment just to go over it with you. So this red line on the right side of the screen shows you where Old Granite Street is. That's the front of the building. That box shows you the main entrance where patrons come into the bar, get checked in, and then start proceeding in. There's a main bar entrance that you'll be hearing about, or main bar section. There's a dance floor in front of a shaded area, which is the stage that had live music. And there's a ramp area that you will hear people refer to that's right next to the dance floor. Those are the main areas that you'll be hearing about during the trial. There are also several, as you can see, smaller bars and seating areas throughout the GOAT. Now the interior of the GOAT contains several surveillance cameras, and you'll be seeing footage from three different angles. In red, something called the pool table cam, which shows you the ramp and the dance floor area. In green, there's a camera called the main and sidebar two, which shows you the main bar and the ramp. And in blue, the main bar window, which shows you the main bar and the exit going back out of the goat. Now on the surveillance video, you will see the defendant and his two friends, Gage Chandler and Matthew Soldano. And as you can see from the stills that were taken from the surveillance photo, the defendant was wearing a gray knit hat that night and a black North Face sweatshirt. Gage Chandler over to the left was wearing a tan zip pullover and Matthew Soldano was wearing a gray knit hat and a blue long sleeve shirt. Now the defendant and his friends went to the GOAT on the night of Friday, January 27th, 2023. And while they were there, the defendant's ex-girlfriend, Abby Elliott Orr, arrived with two of her friends, Nicole Bergeron and Olivia Leonardo. Now the defendant and Abby had dated the summer before, and though they had broken up, he was still obsessed with her. <coughs> when Abby and her friends arrived at the GOAT, they went to the dance floor where Timmy Pouliot and his friends began talking with them. You will also see Timmy and his friends in the surveillance video. And again, these are still taken from that footage that you will see during trial. Timmy on the top is the one with the curly blonde hair and he's wearing a black sweater and a necklace. His friend Trenton Nash is to the left wearing a white baseball cap and a black jacket. And his friend Michael Mendoza is to the right wearing a white and black sweater. This is a still from surveillance video showing the dance floor and ramp area that I was talking about at the GOAT. In that yellow box, you can see Timmy with the blonde hair, Trent and Nash, the back of his head with the white baseball cap, and Michael Mendoza. And you can see them starting to talk to Abby and her two friends, Nicole and Olivia. 
And in the background, in that red box, you can see the defendant watching them. Now, as soon as the defendant saw Timmy talking with his ex-girlfriend, he went over and he started to escalate things. Now, the defendant had never met Timmy before that night, but he made his presence known now. He didn't introduce himself. He didn't ask how they were doing. He walked up to the group and asked Abby and her friends what they were doing with this scum. Now, Timmy was five foot seven inches and 121 pounds. And Timmy was not armed. The defendant was almost a foot taller and about 200 pounds heavier than Timmy with a handgun hidden in his waistband. Now, Timmy laughed off the defendant's name calling at first, and then he told Abby and her friends to be safe and to enjoy their night. And he politely left the group. Timmy even spoke to the defendant and shook his hand before going on his way. After a little while, Abby and her friends left the defendant still over there on the dance floor in that red box and went up to the bar that you can see in the yellow box area. Timmy and Michael Mendoza were at the bar and they thought they might still have a shot. So they offered to buy Nicole a drink. And with the defendant still down by the dance floor and safely out of earshot, they talked tough to Abby and her friends. They said that they wanted to fight the defendant. They said that they were pro fighters. And Timmy told the women that he thought he could take the defendant. 5'7", 121 pound Timmy Pouliot told Abby and her friends that he thought he could take the defendant. Now, as soon as Abby and her friends walked back over to where the defendant was, Abby told the defendant that Timmy and his friends had said they wanted to knock him out and that they were pro-fighters. You will hear that when Abby told the defendant that Timmy had dared to say he could beat him up, the defendant didn't go to a bouncer for help. He didn't grab his friends and say, it's time for us to leave. He didn't try to de-escalate the situation in any way because he wasn't scared. He wasn't in fear, but he was angry really angry. He stared at Timmy, still sitting at the bar, now talking to an acquaintance named Isla Baramovich. And the defendant watched him. And then he confronted him. With the defendant's friend, Gage Chandler, watching behind him in that yellow box. The defendant towered over Timmy's back and he repeatedly and aggressively challenged Timmy to go outside. Timmy kept saying no, he wouldn't go outside, but the defendant kept challenging him. And Isla will, t Isla will tell you that she knew the defendant was a threat. And you will see in the surveillance footage that she was so intimidated by the defendant's size and aggression <coughs> that she left to get a bouncer for help. But before she could, the defendant escalated from words to physical violence. He shoved Timmy and he shoved him hard enough that Timmy slid to the left up against another person at the bar. He shoved him hard enough that it caught the attention of Brian Delaney in the blue box there, the bouncer at the other end of the bar. And Brian and other bouncers jumped in and pulled the defendant away from Timmy. Now this is part of surveillance footage that you'll see during the trial. We're now looking at it from a different angle and you can see the defendant's back here with his hat and his friend Gage standing off to the left. Timmy's blocked by the defendant who's in front of him still at the bar.
Now, after the defendant shoved Timmy there, he didn't ask those bouncers that came over for help. He didn't say that he shoved him because he was afraid of Timmy. Instead, when Brian Delaney asked the defendant why he was starting something with such a little kid, the defendant laughed and said that Timmy had called him a bitch. Then the defendant went back down to the ramp near the dance floor to stand with Abby and their friends. Now, Timmy's friends, Michael Mendoza and Trenton Nash, were standing in that same area, and you can see the top of their heads there in that yellow box. You will see that after the defendant assaulted Timmy at the bar, Timmy walked down the ramp and whispered something to Michael. Within seconds, Michael walked over to the defendant and took a swing at him. The defendant grabbed Michael and threw him to the ground, knocking them both into the bar in the process. Now, bouncers from the GO immediately jumped in to break up the fight. And along with Manchester police officer Eric Smith, they kicked out Michael Mendoza and they kicked out the defendant who was bleeding on the left side of his face from the altercation. During the trial, you will see and you'll be able to hear footage of the defendant being kicked out of the GOAT. That was taken by actually a cell phone video from someone in the bar. And you will see the defendant here, as well as Timmy in the background and Abby and the bouncers around him. This is the edge of Officer Smith, who you'll see in the video. You will see and hear the defendant's emotions. He was in a rage. He was swearing, he was yelling, but he wasn't yelling that he was afraid of Timmy or that he was afraid of Timmy's friends. He wasn't yelling for someone to come help him. He was yelling for someone to come fight him. He was yelling, who just punched me in the face? Come fucking fight me, come fight me, come fight me. No fear, no terror, just anger. He wanted to finish the fight. He was demanding to finish the fight. You will see surveillance from outside the GOAT after the defendant and Michael Mendoza were kicked out. Now Michael and his, was the first one to leave the bar with Trent and Nash and they're highlighted there in that yellow circle. And when they left, they walked across Old Granite Street and got into their car. The white car parked here. Shortly afterwards, the defendant was kicked out. He didn't go straight to his car. He didn't ask for help from a bouncer or from Officer Smith, who was in the go. He didn't quietly walk his separate way. And stayed, he, instead, he stayed on the sidewalk outside the GOAT, surrounded by his friends, with his arms raised, continuing to swear and yell and challenge someone to come fight him. Yelling, who punched me, what's up? Who punched me, what's up? This is a clip of the surveillance footage that you will see at trial capturing those moments as the defendant leaves the GOAT followed up the street by Abby and her friends as he repeatedly screamed, who punched me, what's up? Still angry, still looking for a fight. Now, Timmy also left the GOAT after the defendant and Michael were kicked out. He wasn't yelling or swearing. He didn't leave angry. He walked out calmly and he turned left and started walking the opposite direction from the defendant and his friends down Old Granite Street. Now, at this point, Michael Mendoza and Trenton Nash were in their car. Timmy was walking away 
This should have been the end of the confrontation. But the defendant wasn't done. He still wanted to fight. Now we're looking at a screenshot from surveillance video from the other direction. So we're looking back down towards the goat. Timmy's gone off the screen to this direction. The red box shows you the defendant who's standing there with Michael Mendez, I'm sorry, with Matthew Soldano, with Gage Chandler, with Abby and her friends, all in that group. And Michael Mendoza and Trent Nash are still in this car. Matt, Gage, Abby, Olivia, Nicole, are, were all trying to calm down the defendant at that point, but they couldn't. He kept getting more and more aggravated. And you will hear, as you could hear on that last surveillance video, how he continued to scream and yell at a street full of people leaving the bars, yelling derogatory words and insults. At this point, Trenton Nash got out of the car and walked across the street and started talking to the defendant and his group of friends. But the defendant didn't want a conversation. He wanted a fight. So he assaulted Trenton, striking him in the head, not once, but twice. You can see Trenton at the beginning of this clip of the video, right here, with the white hat and he's smoking and he's walking over towards the defendant and his friends. At this point, when the defendant hit Trenton, Michael Mendoza got out of the car and came over from where he had been sitting in the driver's seat. He pulled out pepper spray and he pointed it at the defendant to get him to back down. The defendant pulled a handgun out of his waistband, dropped it on the sidewalk, picked it back up and racked it. Abby screamed at the defendant to put the gun away and at this point, his friends finally managed to push him up the street, away from the goat, and away from Michael and Trent. Now, Timmy was not there when the defendant struck Trent. He was still back down the street. But you will see on video footage where he stopped and started looking back up towards the street, toward the confrontation that was being caused by the defendant, before eventually walking back up Old Granite Street. You will also be able to see in this footage, the defendant's friend, Matt Soldano, clearly trying to calm the defendant down as they went up the street, trying to get him to listen and trying to get him to leave. Now the defendant, Matt and Gage, his friends, went up the sidewalk in the direction of that red arrow. Past Soho Bistro, which was another bar marked in the orange, which was also letting out at that time. Patrons were leaving at the end of the night. Michael Mendoza and Trenton Nash walked up the street but turned to their left as marked by that blue path and went into the Bank of America parking lot which was on the opposite side of the street. At this point, the defendant's path to his car, his transportation home was clear. Right down that alley to the left-hand side of Soho back to the Market Basket parking lot where his car was parked. Now you may hear a claim that this alley didn't seem safe to the defendant and to his friends. Pay close attention to the video surveillance when you watch it at trial and you will see that the defendant's friend Matt tried to get him to go this way. This was the path straight to their car. There was no one in their way. At this point, there was no one following them Timmy was still down the street. Michael and Trenton were in the Bank of America parking lot on the other direction. That was the way home. 
But the defendant didn't want to go home because he wasn't done. He was still angry and he wanted to finish the fight. He wanted to use his gun. You will see on this video how after starting to follow his friend Matt, Matt's direction and walking towards his car, the defendant turned and came back towards Old Granite Street, ignoring Matt's attempts to stop him. And you will see that Matt yelled at him, he pushed on him, he pointed down that alley trying to get the defendant to disengage, but nothing worked. The defendant was angry and he didn't want to leave. He wanted to fight. So we went, he went past Matt back onto Old Granite Street. This is the video from the defendant in the alley. The defendant pushed past Matt right to this intersection, marked in red, to square off with Timmy. He didn't go down to the alley to his car so he could leave. He didn't take a right towards the SNU Center in downtown Manchester to just leave the area. He didn't walk into Soho, which was open right there in the corner, or back to the GOAT, which were full of people. He didn't yell out to security or to anyone else for help. He didn't use his cell phone to call 911. Instead, the defendant chose to walk straight out onto Old Granite Street and square up with Timmy and his friends. And let's be clear, you will see that this was not one against three. Matt Soldano was standing right here next to the defendant. Defense friend Gage Chandler was right off to the corner over here. This is Timmy and Michael Mendoza and Trent Lynch. And as they stood there, surrounded by people leaving the bars, as they faced off and argued back and forth in the street, Timmy gave the defendant the excuse he'd been looking for all night. Timmy reached up and punched the defendant in the face. The defendant immediately ripped the gun from his pocket and started pulling the trigger without hesitation. He pulled his handgun out for the final time that night and shot nine times straight at Timmy Pulliot. And he was so close to Timmy and so focused on pumping those bullets into him that he hit Timmy eight times. Continuing to shoot, even though Timmy started to turn and fall away to the ground after the first gunshot. The defendant kept shooting after Timmy's back was to him. He kept shooting all the time that Timmy was falling to the ground his body full of bullets. Two of those bullets in his front, one in his hand, and five in his back. Five shots in Timmy's back because this wasn't about fear. This wasn't about a threat. This was anger. <laughs> After the defendant pulled his trigger nine times, he briefly watched Timmy's body on the ground. Then he turned his back on Timmy, turned his back on Timmy's friends, and simply walked away, leaving Timmy to bleed out and die on the pavement. Now let's be clear, the shooting happened very fast. And it happened that fast because the defendant pulled the trigger that fast. So fast that no one on that street had time to process what he was doing. No one had time to stop him 
The most that Timmy could do was turn away. But that didn't stop the defendant. He continued to pull that trigger even after the first shot, when Timmy started falling. The defendant kept shooting in spite of the people in the streets, in spite of the cars in the streets. He opened fire close enough that people ran for cover, close enough that Isla, who had just pulled onto Old Granite Street with a car full of her friends, felt the concussion from the force of the bullets on the roof of her car. Not only did the, t did the defendant murder Timmy, he endangered the lives of all those people on the street that night. Now, there will be no question in this case that the defendant pulled out a gun and shot Timmy Puglia, causing his death. The question for you will be, do you believe his claim that he acted in self-defense? You will receive detailed instructions from the judge on self-defense at the end of this trial. For now, I'm just going to quickly talk to you about two requirements for self-defense to keep in mind when you are seeing and hearing the evidence in this case. The defendant is only allowed to use deadly force to defend himself if he actually believed Timmy was about to use deadly force against him, and if that belief was reasonable. You are going to see a lot of evidence that was caught on video. You will be able to see almost all of the events that I have described for you as they played out that night. You will see people's actions. You will see their reactions on their faces and in their body language. You will see people's emotions as the night played out. Watch the defendant. Watch his facial expressions. Watch his body language. Listen to his words and his tone of voice. You will see anger. You will see someone looking for a fight. You will see all the other options the defendant had that night other than shooting his gun. What you are not going to see at any time from the defendant is fear. You will not see fear of Timmy. You will not see fear of Timmy's friends. You will not see actual fear at any time throughout the night. And you will not see a reason for fear because there was none. The defendant's friends were next to him. Timmy and his friends were unarmed. Timmy was almost a foot shorter than the defendant and about 200 pounds lighter than the defendant. A punch from Timmy Pouliot to the defendant was not deadly force. Instead of fear, you will see that the defendant initiated and escalated at every stage of the night. He confronted Timmy when he was talking to Abby on the dance floor. He shoved Timmy when he was sitting at the bar with Isla. When the defendant was kicked out of the bar, he was yelling for someone to come fight him. He punched Trent Nash twice on the street. He was consistently the aggressor and he had a safe way to leave the confrontation he had started, right down the alley that Matt Soldano was trying to get him to go down. But instead, he turned and he came back, still looking for a fight. The law doesn't allow a person to instigate and escalate and demand a fight and then claim self-defense when someone punches him. When the defendant was arrested by police just after he shot Timmy, he knew he was caught, he knew he was in trouble, and he tried to convince them that he acted in self-defense. And you will hear that he claimed things that the video footage will show you just are not true. Like that it was three against one, even though his friends were right there. But those self-serving statements can't erase his behavior up until this point, and they won't erase what you can see for yourself on the video. The other thing to keep in mind as you're hearing the evidence is that a person's not permitted to use excessive force in self-defense, only a reasonable amount of force. The defendant shot at Timmy Puglia nine times. Five of those shots were in his back. And each of those shots was a choice by the defendant to pull the trigger. You will see that every shot after the first one was after Timmy was turning away and falling to the ground. That is not reasonable. That is not proportional.
That is excessive by any definition. In a moment, defense counsel will have a chance to speak with you as I have. They may raise issues with you that I've not discussed in the opening, but which will be addressed during trial. I ask you to keep an open mind and wait to hear all of the evidence, see all of the video footage before you make up your mind. The shooting in this case was captured on a bystander's cell phone. This is a still image of the last moments that Timmy Pouliot was alive. Right after he dared to square off with the defendant, dared to punch the defendant. Of all the options available to the defendant that night, he chose the most extreme reaction, he chose the most deadly, and he chose the most permanent. Dude, these guys are all talking. Huh? Get the fuck back. Hey, get back here, back here. That is not self-defense. That is rage and retribution and anger. And that is why at the close of this case, we will ask you to find the defendant guilty of endangering all the people on Old, old Granite Street that night and of murdering Timmy Pouliot. Take a 10 minute recess. We'll resume with the defense close, uh, closing, defense opening in uh, at 2.30.
Tim and, and Mike. And they relay. Tim says that he's going to beat up John or, or knock him out or something along those lines. Michael Mendoza also says he's going to knock John out. They talk about the fact that Timothy is a professional fighter, and they talk about it to Abby, Nicole, and Olivia. They're not just having a little conversation in private talking about this. They are conveying that information to the same girls that they had just been talking to earlier. We're going to knock this guy out by the end of the night. I'm a professional fighter. And so, of course... The girls go warn John. Why shouldn't they warn him? These guys are out to knock you out. They're out for you. And John goes up to the bar, and we'll, we don't have a recording of what was said, but we have the recording of the interaction. And sure, John pushes him. Um, but it's broken up, and John walks away, and that is the end of it as far as he knows. You'll also see the bartenders don't only talk to John. They talk to Timothy Puglia. And after they do that, John is minding his own business, talking to the girls, talking to Abby and the other girls. And a few minutes later, you see Michael Mendoza in the video. He's near John but he's kind of looking the other way. And you see <laughs> Timothy work his way down the ramp. Remember that ramp that was shown to you during the opening statement? John and the girls are all standing by the end of that ramp on the dance floor. The dance floor is kind of lower than the, that main bar. And Tim works his way down onto the dance floor and out and whispers something, not sure what, into Michael Mendoza's ear. And Mendoza does kind of a little half moon right up to John and looks away a little bit and then all of a sudden punches him right in the face. A sucker punch so bad you'll see the blood all over John's face. This is on the right side of his face. Michael Mendoza was not unarmed at that time. You're going to see body cam video of the police officer that's in the bar. And you'll just catch a little glimpse of it. But you're going to see rings on both of Mendoza's hands. He doesn't punch John in the face with bare hands. He's got a big old ring on his ring finger there. That explains the giant cut on the front of John's face. And you're going to see the, the blood coming down his face. There's, you're going to see that in the videos, too. John never saw it coming. That's why he's walking out of the bar screaming, Who punched me? Who punched me? He just got sucker punched in the face, and his face has been cut open. Is he upset? Absolutely he's upset. Because he's just been darn close to being knocked out after he was already told that they were going to knock him out. And when he gets up, gets outside, he's upset, and the girls are trying to calm him down, and they're trying to clean the blood off his face, and he's still upset. And the state's right. It should have ended there, but it didn't. Mendoza is across the street in his car. Trent Nash is in the car. And Mendoza kind of hides, stays in the car. And Nash gets out, and he walks over, and he comes right up to John. He smokes a cigarette and tries to pretend that he's got no idea what happened, as if he had nothing to do with anything that happened in the bar, as if he wasn't there with Timothy Pouliot, as if he wasn't there with Michael Mendoza. And he comes right up to him, and he gets in his face, and even though John DeLee, who's just been punched in the face, tells him to get out of here, even though Abigail Elliott Orr tells him to get out of here, he doesn't. 
Does John get physical with him at that point? Yes. Should he have? Probably not. But he's not on trial for his interaction with Trenton Nash at that point, who, by the way, is just continuing the attack from inside of the bar. At that point, Michael Mendoza says, you know, I ought to get involved in this. Now's when he comes out of the car, gets up, stands on the snowbank, and holds up a can of pepper spray right into John's face. Right there on the sidewalk. That's when John pulls out the gun. When he is under attack, he pulls out the gun, he drops it, and he picks it back up, and he warns Michael Mendoza away. And it works. Michael Mendoza backs up and backs away. And John turns around. And John and Soldano and Gage Chandler, the three of them start walking up the street, walking away. That's not good enough for Nash and Mendoza. They follow him up the street. And I just want to back up a little bit. Remember when you were told that Tim walks out of the bar nice and calm, he's not screaming and yelling, and he walks out of the bar and he goes left. You'll see what he does on the video. He walks out of the bar and he looks to the right, and that's where Natch and DeLee are just about engaging. And he takes a look and he walks down to the end of the street and he acts as a lookout. He's watching the end of that street and he's watching that interaction and he's deciding when and if he needs to get engaged. So when Nash is confronting DeLee, you've got Mendoza in the car across the street watching from one angle and you've got Timothy Pouliot down at the end of the street watching from the other angle. They are in attack mode, and they will not leave John DeLee to go home that night. They follow him up the street. As Mendoza and Nash are following John and his friends up the street, they're yelling back as loud as they can to Timothy Pouliot, he's got a gun, he's got a gun. Mendoza is actively telling Pouliot he's got a gun. What does Pouliot do? He goes right after John, right up the street. Abigail Elliot Orr confronts him. She grabs him. She tries to stop him. She says, don't do it. And what does Timothy Pouliot do? He challenges her to punch him in the face. She declines to do so, and he goes on, he gets away from her, and he goes on to confront John DeLee, a man that he knows has a gun. And he follows him up. Now, John, at that point, is facing a long, dark alley to get back to his car. Matthew Soldano is standing at the end of the street, but Nash and Mendoza are standing on the opposite sidewalk, yelling and screaming at him, harassing him. And Timothy Pouliot walks up and leads the charge. You'll see on the video, as soon as Timothy walks past Mendoza and Nash to confront John DeLee, Nash and Mendoza themselves begin following Timothy. It's a setup. John DeLee supposed to walk down the dark alley with these people following him? Is that a reasonable place to go? So, unarmed. Right now we know at the very least that John DeLee has been punched in the face with rings. We know that Mendoza has rings on. We know that Mendoza has pepper spray. 
and the three of them are confronting him. And rather than walk all the way down that dark alley, he turns around to confront the threat that's facing him. And so he does. And you'll notice, you'll see in that video, you see the three people surrounding him. You see Fouliot standing directly, almost face to face with John DeLee. And you'll see to the right, to John's right, you'll see Mike Mendoza. And to the right of Mike Mendoza, you'll see Trenton Nash. Interesting little detail that the state leaves out at that point. When you see the video of Trenton Nash following Timothy Pouliot to, a, to go attack John, he's wearing his coat. He's got a long sleeve black coat on. Michael Mendoza's already in his t-shirt. This is a cold January day in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. And Michael Mendoza's out there in a t-shirt. Why? Because he's about to get in a fight. Nash has had his coat on. The funny thing about the Soho footage is part of it looks to the right and part of it looks to the left. So the right looks down the alley and the left looks down Old Granite Street. And the shooting happens right in the middle. And the only footage we have of the shooting itself is that cell phone video. But between the time that Nash crosses into that blind spot, we'll call it, and the time that cell phone video starts, his coat is gone. Why is his coat off in January in New Hampshire on a cold winter night if he is not part of this fight? So he's got his coat off, right? And that's not the only thing he does. The state says it's not three on one. John's got all his friends there. Well, first of all, Gage Chandler, you don't see him in that video because he is up on the sidewalk on the other side of a snowbank and on another side of the rail in front of the Soho Beast. <coughs> He's not out there in the street getting involved in this. And Matthew Soldano is confronted by Trenton Nash, who's already thrown his top coat off. Hey, do you have a gun? He checks him. He checks him. And how does Matthew Saldano react to that? He puts his hands up and he starts walking away. He's behind John DeLee. He's walking away and he's facing away. And that's the moment when it is truly three on one with two other people who all mean John DeLee harm, that's when, for the second time in the same evening, John DeLee gets punched in the face by somebody that he has been told is a professional fighter. They've told him they're going to knock him out. They meant it. They've shown they mean it. And if you're standing on that street there, with a gun in your hand, knowing that these people know you have a gun and are ready to punch you in the face anyways, ready to surround you, ready to confront you, ready to punch you in the face, they do. Second time, he's been punched directly in the head. <coughs> How does he know that they don't mean to get his gun? How does he know that they don't mean to kill him? How does he know that they don't mean to kill him with his own gun? The judge is going to talk to you about the definition of deadly force. So take the judge's definition and not mine. But deadly force in New Hampshire means an assault which the actor commits with the purpose of causing or which he knows to create a substantial risk of causing death or serious bodily injury. What do you think, will, what will you think that Timothy Pouliot meant to do to John DeLee at that time? What will you think that Trenton Nash meant to do to John DeLee at that time? 
What will you think that Michael Mendoza meant to do to John Delia at that time, if not death or serious bodily injury? So the moment he gets punched in the face, again for the second time, he immediately pulls out his gun and fires. The state makes a lot about the fact that some of the bullets went into Timothy Pouliot's back. I want to make absolutely clear, Timothy Pouliot did not run away. He didn't retreat from this encounter. At the time that the trigger is first pulled, he's facing John DeLee. He falls backwards and he lands backwards facing John DeLee. He might have twisted in, on his way down, but he wasn't retreating from that encounter. He never did. Those nine shots happen in a split second. The state would make you think, John DeLee thought, between each and every time he pulled that trigger, oh, have I neutralized the threat yet? Nope, oh, have I neutralized the threat yet? That's not the speed that any of this happens. He's facing a serious threat to his life and his well-being, and he pulls the trigger fast. He, the moment the threat is neutralized, you'll see Mendoza and Nash go running, Timothy Pouliot's no longer a threat, and he walks away. Now, lest you think that John DeLee can't recognize the difference between a real threat to his life and his safety and a fake threat to his life and safety, you're going to see when the police officers arrive. Those police officers arrive, they pull their guns on him. And he knows that those police officers don't mean him harm because the first thing he does is take the gun and put it down on the ground. He puts the gun down on the ground and away from him so quickly that the police officers, both police officers that are involved in detaining him at that point, both of them have to ask what happened to the gun, even though he did it right in front of them. Put your gun down there, yelling at him, and he's pointing. You can see him point at the gun on the ground. So even police officers that are pointing guns at him, he knows that they're not a threat. He doesn't try to use any kind of force against them. He puts the gun down on the ground. He gets down on his knees. He puts his arms out and he says, it was self-defense. It was three on one. They attacked me. Immediately. That's what he's telling the police. If you go back and look at all the evidence in this case, at the end of this case, which you're going to have the ability to do. You're going to see that everything that John DeLee told the police right then and there was correct. Timothy Pouliot, Michael Mendoza, and Trenton Nash planned an attack on him. They used tactical maneuvers to attack him. They threatened him. They pursued him. They gave him no out. Unfortunately, Timothy Pouliot lost his life as a result of it. And again, the state's right. It should have ended many times before then. But John DeLee is not guilty of these crimes that he's charged with. And at the end of the case, we'll come back and ask you again to find him not guilty. Thank you.
Your Honor, the state would call Officer Chad Fazio. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Yes, Your Honor. We have the seat. Officer Fazio, if you could, just for the record, you might have to lean that microphone forward just a little bit. There you go. Can you just state and spell your last name for the record? It's going to be Officer Fazio, F-A-Z-I-O. Okay. And where do you work, Officer Fazio? Manchester Police Department. And how long have you worked there? Three years, sir. And where did you work before that? Nowhere, sir. Is this your first law enforcement job? Yes, sir. Okay. And what's your current assignment at Manchester? I work on the midnight shift for the patrol division. Okay. And is that what we see kind of driving around the city in a, in a you know, uniform capacity in a marked cruiser? Yes, sir. Okay. And are you a full-time certified police officer? Yes, sir. All right. Was your role in January of this year also patrol? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I want to take you back to specific time in January. I want to take you to uh, January 28th in the early morning hours. Were you working at that time? Yes, I was, sir. What shift were you working? I was working the midnight shift. All right. And what was your area of responsibility that night? Do you have sectors or patrols or how does that work? Yeah, so we have different sectors. That night I was 1-6. It's kind of just like, a, uh, like an extra car. It's a floating unit where we have the liberty to kind of go anywhere in the city. Okay. And... At about 12.47 a.m. that morning, were you dispatched to a call? Yes, sir. What type of call were you dispatched to? It was a gunshot heard call. And where was that? It was at a 50 Old Granite Street. Okay. And did you witness the shooting? No, sir. Did you witness any of the events that happened before the shooting? No, I did not, sir. All right. So before we talk about your response, I want to talk a little bit about that area in general. So I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 1. And do you recognize this? Yes, I do, sir. Okay. What is depicted in this satellite image? Can you just help orient us and explain what we're looking at? Yep. So this is basically the uh, downtown area of Manchester. Um, running north to south, the biggest street, that's going to be Elm Street. Um, if, sorry, you wanna, if you want to step down, you, you're on a, do you yeah, mind if the witness steps down? Okay. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Step down right here. Elm Street's going to be this big street running north to south right here. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Good. All right. That's it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So, like I said, Elm Street's going to be running north to south. We got the Snow Arena here. Lake Ave and Granite Street are going to be running east to west. We got Market Basket here, and then Old Granite Street is going to be this little tiny street running right through there. Okay, so you mentioned some places, but just um, because the record's audio recorded, sometimes I need to point out specific things. So you had mentioned the Snow Arena, you had mentioned Market Basket. Are those accurately, uh, reasonably and accurately reflected in this diagram? Yes, sir. Where those locations are? Okay. So if we just zoom in a little bit, I'm going to take you to State's Exhibit 2. Can you just help describe what we're looking at here? So we have Grand Street right here. Again, this is just the downtown area. We've got the Bank of America. We've got two of our bars right here which is the Soho Bistro and the GOAT. And that's Old Granite Street, so just a little bit to the right, that's Granite Street. That runs down kind of between Elm and 293? Exactly, sir. Okay, all right. Um, if you want to go back, go ahead and go back to um, back to the stand for me. All right, so when you responded that night, you said you were running a uniform capacity. Do you have body-worn cameras? Yes, I do, sir. And where are those on your uniform? Um, I have mine right here. It's usually right in the uh, center of our chest. Okay. And so it's looking forward? Yes, sir. And how does it work? Um, as soon as you activate it by using your little like device on our wrist or wherever the other officers put it, it begins recording at that time as soon as you hit it. Okay. And did you activate it um, this night when you responded? Yes, I did, sir. Okay. When you got to that Soho Bistro right at that corner that you pointed out, um, can you describe for us what you saw on your arrival? Uh, when I got out of the car, I saw 
that there was a large group of people in the middle of the street, which would be Old Granite Street. And then I saw a male laying on his back in the middle of that group on the, uh, on the pavement. And was that man, you said lying, was he talking, moving, making any statements? No, sir, he was unresponsive. <laughs> and what did you immediately do at that point? Um, at that time, I started doing a medical assessment or a bath assessment. What is bath? Bath, so, bath is in B-A-T-H? Yes, sir. Okay, what does that stand for? So it's an acronym. So it stands for when you're going into a medical assessment, it's just things that you're kind of looking over. So B is bleeding, A is airway, T is tension pneumothorax, and then H is just hypothermia. Okay, and those are the things you're trained to look for when you first respond to something like this? Correct, sir. Okay, are you a, an emergency medical provider? No, sir. Where did you receive this type of training? So every year at the Manchester Police Department, we go through a course called tactical medical training, and that's for the last three years, that's what I've been doing. Okay. Um, did you try to render any aid to the person who was lying on the ground? Yes, I did, sir. Okay. I'm going to show you a still image. This is that image that was discussed earlier. Um, I'm going to show you States Exhibit 3. This is a still image. Do you recognize where this is from? Yes, I do, sir. And where is this image taken from? Oh, this is coming from my body camera. Does this accurately reflect where the person was when you found them in relation to Soho? Yes, it is, sir. Okay. Who's, whose hands do we see there? We see some with gloves. Whose hands are the ones without gloves? Those are mine, sir. Okay. Uh, any reason no gloves? Just uh, due to the response, I didn't have time to put any on. Okay. And it... It looks like there's some sort of plastic or something on, on the left shoulder there. Is that part of the treatment you were providing? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you just talk briefly and just explain to us what did you try to do um, to render aid to this person? Um, so first, I found that there was uh, multiple gunshot wounds. One was being uh, like up on his left shoulder area where you saw that plastic piece. And then there was another one in his armpit that showed in that picture right there. Um, at that point, because of the location of the wound, I put a chest seal on the one that was located like near his armpit region on the shoulder. And then the armpit one, I began packing with um, combat gauze. Okay. And was that an attempt to stop bleeding? Yes, sir. Did you perform or did anyone that was there perform CPR? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and... Did emergency medical um, responders arrive at some point? They did. Okay, and did they take, take over treatment? Yes, they did. Okay. At any point during your treatment, did you see any responsiveness or signs of life from the person who you found lying down? No, sir. Okay. Did you ever see the person lying on the ground ever conscious again? No, sir. What happened after fire and EMS treated Timmy for a few minutes? Um, they declared him 10-2, which in our terms is deceased. And what was your role after, um, after Timmy, or excuse me, after that person was pronounced dead? Um, after that, I didn't have much role. I just basically uh, cleaned myself off and provided scene security at that point. Okay. Did you have any further involvement with investigating what happened that night? No, oh, sir. Just one second. When you were doing your assessment of this person lying on the ground, did you see any weapons, um, knives, guns, bats, anything at all on that person? I did not, sir. Okay. Um, I have no further questions for defense, May. No questions, you have. Okay. Thank you, sir. Step down. Your next witness. You're in the state call of Jill Terrio.
Good afternoon. Before you see it, if you can just raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Please have a seat. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Terrio. Hi, good afternoon. Um, there's water up there, too, if you need it. And Thank there's you. a microphone that's kind of in front of you, so if I can't hear you, I'll ask you to speak up, but just if you're okay. right, that's where we're Thank recording you. Thank you. Um, could you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Yes, my name is Jill Terrio, last name spelled T as in Tom, H-E-R-R-I-A-U-L-T. And where do you work, Ms. Terrio? Uh, currently, I'm employed with the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Lab in Concord, New Hampshire. And what's your position there? Uh, there, I am a criminalist, too, um, in the section of um, the Pattern Evidence Unit, and more specifically, I am a firearm and tool mark examiner. And can you explain what the Pattern Evidence Unit is? <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, yes, so the forensic laboratory is composed of a number of different uh, forensic testing areas and the pattern evidence unit, which is the unit that I work in, uh, is made up of latent print, finger, uh, latent print and fingerprint examiners, uh, shoe, uh, footwear and tire track examiners, as well as myself that uh, examines firearms and tool marks. And how long have you worked for the New Hampshire State Forensic Lab? Uh, it'll be four years in December. And do you have educational background that relates to what you do for work? Uh, I do, yes. Um, in 2001, I received my Bachelor of Science uh, degree from Rutgers University in New Jersey. And in 2004, um, I began on-the-job training uh, through my first job in the forensics field at the Miami-Dade Police Department uh, Crime Laboratory Bureau. Can you just explain the experience that you've had with Miami and, and what prior uh, forensic experience you've had leading up to the lab? Yes, so um, in 2004 is when I was hired on by the Miami-Dade Police Department Crime Lab. And in that capacity, um, I began a two-year in-house training program that was conducted under the supervision of a senior firearms examiner. And so that two-year training program included uh, learning about firearms and how they operate and how all of the internal parts and pieces work together to make a gun work, uh, how ammunition uh, functions inside of a firearm and how that's evolved over the centuries. And most importantly, learning how to use particular pieces of forensic equipment to examine bullets and cartridge cases that are collected from crime scenes in order to determine whether or not they were fired from a particular gun. Um, so that was my in-house training. Um, in 2004, I was also selected by the ATF, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, to participate in their one-year uh, National Firearms Examiner uh, Training Academy. And that training in conjunction with my in-house training um, followed similar steps in that I learned about how firearms operate, how different firearms such as rifles and shotguns and handguns work, um, how to examine um, uh, bullets and cartridge cases using a comparison microscope to determine whether or not they were fired from a particular gun, as well as some other uh, forensic testing duties um, that are typical of a, of a firearms examiner. Um, my instructors at the ATF program were firearms examiners from all across the country. Um, so when I was finished with the in-house and the ATF training, uh, I spent 10 years down at the Miami lab uh, doing firearms examination. And then in 2014 is when I moved a little further north. I was employed by the State of Connecticut Forensic Laboratory. And there I was the uh, supervisor of the firearm and toolmark unit. Do you hold these certifications now that are specific to um, your field? Uh, yes, I do. Like um, through the professional organization that I belong to, which is called the Association of Firearm and Toolmark Examiners, they offer a certification program that a person or an examiner is eligible to sit for once they've attained five years, uh, so two years of training and three years of uh, doing casework. Um, so when I was eligible to sit for that, I sat for the, um, the written test, and then upon successful completion of that, I was able to take a practical exercise uh, where I received actual bullets and cartridge cases to determine what possible gun they were uh, fired from. And then once I was completed that, um, I have to maintain a, no a certain number of continuing education uh, credits. And those are attained by um, attending training conferences, giving, confer uh, giving presentations at those conferences, teaching opportunities and things like that. And that's in a five-year cycle. And I've held that certification since 2009. So about how many firearms examinations would you say you've conducted in your career? Oh gosh, going back to 2004, it would probably be in the thousands, I would say, between Miami, Connecticut, and up here in New Hampshire. 
have you testified in court before regarding um, firearm examinations? Yes, I have. About how many times? Um, on the state and federal and county levels in Florida, Connecticut, and New Hampshire, it's been just over 100 times. And have you previously been qualified as an expert in the area of firearms examinations? Oh, excuse me. Yes, I have. And again, feel free to, you have water there? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> We're all doing it. So. Um, Your Honor, I would ask at this time that the court recognize Ms. Terrio to be qualified as an expert under Rule 702 in the area of firearms. She may offer her opinions. Um, so I just want to take a moment now with you to discuss some of the terminology that you use in your work. Um, do you have a model that helps you explain the process that you use when you're examining? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. What is this a model of? Uh, this is a plastic model of um, a live round of ammunition and its component parts. It's all plastic. Um, there's no live anything um, associated with it. Would you mind taking that out and just showing that to us? <laughs> If you're comfortable where you are, I'll just ask if you can hold it up high enough that we can just kind of see it over some of the stuff that's in front of you. Sure, <laughs> yes. The speaker there. Yes. Um, um, but can you use this and explain to us what a round of ammunition is composed of? Uh, sure. So what I have here, again, is a plastic model of um, what is a live round of ammunition. Um, some people might know it just as a bullet, um, but it's actually made up of four different um, component parts. Uh, so this outer light tan color area is called the cartridge case or the casing. And what's held inside of that is gunpowder. Now, if you look at the back or the bottom of the cartridge case, there's this small circular area called the primer. Uh, the primer is a shock sensitive material. So when this live round of ammunition is in a firearm, uh, when the trigger's pulled and the firing pin moves forward to strike this primer area, that causes a small detonation and that ignites the gunpowder that's housed within this cartridge case. So when that, cart or when that gunpowder starts to burn, um, a whole lot of heat and energy is built up. So that will then send the bullet, which is actually seated in the mouth or the opening of this cartridge case, all that heat and energy sends this bullet down the barrel of the firearm and onto the target. And depending on what type of firearm it is that you're firing, this cartridge case that's now empty uh, will either be extracted and ejected from the gun and land on the ground, or it can remain inside of the gun until the person operating the gun um, manually removes it from um, the cylinder of the gun. So you talked about the fact that a cartridge case, um, different things happen depending on what kind of weapon you're talking about. Can you explain what happens with a semi-automatic firearm? Yes, um, but first let me explain a little bit about what a semi-automatic firearm is. Uh, typically, it's a handgun, um, or it can be a long gun, like a, like a rifle, too. But what semi-automatic means is that with each pull of the trigger, the gun will fire. Uh, and that's a little bit different from, say, the type of firearm that, like, John Wayne, for example, would walk around with. He had uh, what's called a revolver. So that's a little bit of a different way that the gun operates, where these cartridges are held in a metal piece called a cylinder. Um, and once the person is finished shooting, these empty cartridge cases remain inside. But in a semi-automatic firearm, these, when the gun is fired, these empty cartridge cases are extracted and ejected, and they, they are sent out of the firearm. And you see a lot of those types of firearms in like movies and TV and that sort of thing. So every time the trigger is pulled with a semi-automatic firearm, the gun fires the bullet and then ejects the empty casing in some direction. I don't yes. Say necessarily on this side, but yes, it will. One <laughs> each time the gun is fired, uh, the empty cartridge case will be extracted and ejected, and typically that comes out of the gun on the the top side of it, and it's ejected to the right and generally to the rear. And then the gun puts another cartridge into the chamber so it's ready to fire again without the person having to do that. That's correct. Okay. Um, can you explain to us what the difference is between the firing of a semi-automatic weapon and an automatic weapon, or what people might think of as like a machine gun? Or just explain that distinction for us. Sure. Um, so a typical semi-automatic firearm is one where um, every time the person pulls the trigger, the gun will fire. Um, there's a set of components on the inside that sort of resets every time when you pull the trigger and then when you let go. So every time you pull the, tr pull the trigger rearward, the gun fires. Um, the cartridge case is extracted, the bullet goes down the barrel, um, and that whole system sort of resets and you can then pull the trigger again to fire the gun again. Now that's a little bit different from 
what you just mentioned about a fully automatic firearm in which that process of firing the gun, extracting the cartridge case, the bullet traveling down the barrel, where that's repeated many times with um, the person holding the trigger backward, like holding it and keeping it to the rear, where the as long as there's ammunition in the gun, the gun will continue to fire until either it runs out of ammunition or if the person lets go of the trigger with their finger. So if you have a semi-automatic firearm, it's a fair to say that or just to be clear, does every shot from that firearm require a separate squeeze of the trigger from the person holding it? It would, yes. So I'd like to ask you about the testing that you did in connection with this particular case. Yes. Um, which items or item or items were you asked to examine? Uh, there was a Glock semi-automatic pistol that was submitted to the laboratory for this case, as well as a magazine and live ammunition. And as part of the examination that you did, did you pr prepare a report outlining your conclusions with regard to these items? Yes, I did. Did you also take photos of the firearm that you examined? I did, yes. What I'd like to do is show you uh, State's Exhibit 54. Um, what are we looking at in this photo? Uh, so this is a photograph of the firearm that I examined uh, when I opened the box. Uh, I typically will take a photograph of the firearm of, of how I received it. So inside of this gun box is the Glock pistol. Um, there's an orange safety strap that's going through the action of the firearm, the one that's sort of running up and down um, along the grip there. Uh, there's two orange, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, zip ties that are strapping it to the package. And on the front of the firearm, um, there's also a flashlight um, that's mounted on the rails. And when you received it, is this how it comes packaged to you? Is uh, there like a protocol for how the lab takes in a firearm? Uh, typically, yes. This is standard um, submission condition uh, for firearms that come to the laboratory. So could you describe this particular pistol and how it works? Yes, so this is a Glock semi-automatic pistol. Glock is a brand of firearm. Uh, they're from Austria um, that makes all different types of um, models of pistol. Uh, so this is a semi-automatic, and as I mentioned, on the front end of the firearm, there's sort of a, a, um, a laser and a flashlight combination that's mounted there. That's the black object that's right above the ruler there. Um, but again, it's a semi-automatic. Um, in a separate package, there was the magazine, or what's sometimes what people will call a clip, but that's the, um, the device that holds the live rounds of ammunition. Um, so the way that this firearm operates is that if you have the magazine, and it's a sort of a spring-loaded little box uh, container that you put the live rounds of ammunition in, that would then be inserted into the grip or the handle of the firearm. Um, that area right there is hollow so that it accepts, uh, it fits a magazine in there. Uh, so to fire this weapon, uh, once you have put the magazine in the grip or the handle of the firearm, the top portion of the firearm called the slide, which is, it has kind of ridges on the left side of it right here, you would have to pull that backwards. Um, it's under spring tension, so when you pull it backwards and then let it go, it will spring into place. And as that, as that slide moves forward, it's going to take a round of ammunition from the magazine and then place it into what's called the chamber of the firearm. And at that point, this firearm would be then ready to fire. So what is required of a user? You've explained to us what's required of the user to shoot a bullet from this particular pistol. Well, I should say, you've, you've explained to us how the bullet is in place for them to shoot. What is then required at that point for the user to actually shoot the gun? Uh, so once uh, that slide has been retracted and let to go forward, uh, which will then chamber a live round of ammunition, um, at that point, this type of pistol is ready to be fired. Um, so then, uh, using your finger, you would then place your finger on the trigger, which in the middle of the firearm there, it's sort of that sort of triangular shape. Uh, you would place your finger on there and pull that backwards. Um, in this particular type of firearm, pulling the trigger deactivates the safety features that are in the firearm. There's one that you can see on the outside here, which I can explain in just a moment. But pulling the trigger in, the, in a Glock pistol will then deactivate the safety features and the gun can be fired. Um, can you explain to us what you mean by these safety features? Uh, yeah, yes. So, um, actually, may I? Yeah, absolutely. Am I allowed to step you down and us. point? If you want to come down to the side of the TV, that would be... Okay, 
So as I mentioned, the um, this particular pistol has um, what's called a... I'm just going to move the microphone just so we can get you on the recording. So this pistol has what's called, uh, one of the safety features is called a trigger safety. So if we're looking right here, this, this piece right here is the trigger. And this little piece that juts out, sort of sticking out from it, is called the trigger safety. And the, way, the only way that that can be deactivated is by placing your finger on that trigger and the trigger safety and, oh, there we go, and pulling that backwards. When you pull the trigger, that allows this little piece right here that's normally in contact with the frame of the gun that will keep the trigger from moving. Once you press that whole set, the trigger and the safety, that will then deactivate that safety. But otherwise, if the firearm is just sitting, no one's touching it, no one's handling it, um, when it's at rest, this little trigger safety will keep the trigger from moving, the whole trigger from moving backwards. Does that also mean that if you hit the trigger from the side, for example, or jostled it in some way, would it fire at that point? Uh, no, it would not. It protects um, unless the, it, it protects the gun from firing unless a person's finger is actually fully squarely on that trigger, being able to pull it backwards. So if your finger were to slip off, or if um, you were to drop it or anything like that, that trigger safety will keep that trigger from moving rearward. And so what's required to shoot multiple bullets from this particular gun, if you were going to shoot in a row, for example? Um, so as I mentioned just before, um, once the magazine is inserted and the slide has been retracted and a round has been placed in the chamber, you would just need to pull the trigger to fire. Um, what happens next, all of this happens in a very, very quick fashion, in like an instant. Um, there's a part of the firearm that's housed in this area of the slide called the firing pin, and pulling the trigger allows that firing pin to move forward and strike the primer of a cartridge. That primer was that small shock sensitive material on the, on the round of ammunition. Um, once that occurs, uh, the firearm will go off, all of that energy and heat will send the bullet down the barrel of the firearm, and then all of that energy that was created uh, pushes backwards on the slide and overcomes that spring pressure. That backward mov movement of the slide will then extract and eject the cartridge case that's now empty and eject it onto the ground. And then as the slide moves forward again, if there's ammunition in the magazine, it'll take the next round of ammunition and put it into the chamber of the gun. All of the internal parts have been reset and you could pull the trigger again and then the gun would fire again. And that process would be repeated until you either run out of ammunition or you, you stop pulling the trigger. So just to be clear, the gun's resetting itself essentially after you use it, but you still need to actively pull the trigger to shoot another bullet? That's correct, yes. Um, is there anything else that we should know about the, uh, before I ask you to sit down, is there anything else that you wanted to indicate to us about the outside of the weapon? Uh, no, that's it, just the slide. This is the grip area right here um, that's hollow where the magazine goes, the source of ammunition, and right here is the trigger. You mentioned a flashlight also? Um, this device right here that's mounted on the front end of the firearm, um, it's a combination of a laser, like a laser pointer and a flashlight that's, that was mounted on there. Um, and so this specific firearm, does it have any sort of lever or button that you switch to turn on or off? Like sometimes people refer to a safety on the external part of the weapon? Uh, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this doesn't have any external safeties besides that trigger safety that we just talked about. Um, all of the other safety features are housed inside of the firearm. Okay, thank you. You can take a seat here. So what sort of ex examination did you perform with regard to this particular um, weapon in the magazine? Uh, so this firearm underwent uh, what I would call an operability or a function test. Uh, when the firearm was delivered to the laboratory and it was uh, ready to be worked, um, essentially I have a worksheet that I fill out that collects all of the information about the gun. So some of the basic things like the make, model, serial number, um, it would be how it operates, uh, what are those safety features that are present on this firearm, um, its overall condition. Um, I'll look down the barrel to count the number of lands and grooves, which is rifling uh, that's, that's inside of the gun barrel. Uh, I will do what's called a trigger pull test to see how many pounds of pressure it takes to pull the trigger of the firearm. Uh, I will conduct what's called a jar off test to determine whether or not it's susceptible to um, an unintentional discharge um, from it 
drop being dropped or something striking it. Um, once I've gone through all of that, um, the final step in the testing phase would be then to actually test fire it myself. Um, and in that process, uh, I'll select ammunition from the laboratory supply. Um, the ammunition gets marked with the case number um, T1, T2, as in test number one, two, three, however many I fire. And uh, once I've done that, there's a special room at the laboratory that um, houses a um, basically a water tank, a big tank of water um, that a firearms examiner can test fire guns in. And that allows me to collect bullets from that firearm and collect the cartridge cases as well for any uh, comparisons that may need to be done. So, and you engaged in this type of testing with this particular weapon? I did, yes. What conclusions did you reach about the functionality of this pistol? Uh, it was examined, it was test fired, and I found it to function normally, and I found that it was uh, not susceptible to any type of accidental discharge due to jar off. And did you reach any conclusions about the magazine? Uh, the magazine that was submitted uh, along with this, um, it was capable of holding 17 cartridges and it's compatible with the uh, with this pistol and it was also used for test firing. Um, and just one more detail I wanted to ask you about, were, were there certain exhibit numbers that these items came to you with? Uh, yes, the firearm, uh, the submission number for that or the exhibit number was BML as in um, Bob, Mary, Larry, one, and then the package with the magazine and the live ammunition was BML1B. And who assigns those uh, uh, and letters to them? Typically, those indications are given by um, typically the crime scene personnel. Um, let's see. Yes, yeah, so typically um, the people that collect the items from the crime scene, um, I believe that's usually their initials of the, the person that collected it. Um, if I may just have a moment. One more question, Terry. So just to be uh, clear, when you squeeze the trigger of this gun, um, how quickly does it go off? Uh, usually, well, there's there's a little bit of movement when you pull the trigger backwards, but pretty much as soon as you pull it backwards, you'll feel tension in there. And once that tension is sort of overcome by you pulling the trigger rearward, um, that allows the firing pin to move forward. And it's probably within a second or so of you pulling the trigger backwards. I have no further questions at this time. I think defense counsel may have some questions for you. Thank you. Yes, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ms. Terry, I just want to take you through a couple of questions about the lab first, and then we'll get into your, your testing. Yes. Um, I believe you already testified that this is how you received this particular item at the lab? Yes. Okay. Um, and you received a magazine as well, correct? Uh, yes, there was a second package that contained the magazine and some live cartridges. Okay, uh, how many live cartridges, if you recall? Uh, there were four. Okay, was that documented in your report? Yes. I'm going to show you a document. And I believe that there are a number of documents that get generated as a result of your examination, correct? Uh, yes, there are. I'm going to briefly ask you, are you familiar with what's called an evidence examination request? Uh, yes. If I showed you an evidence examination request, would you be able to identify it? Uh, yes, I can check to see if the case number is what I have here in front of me. And that's my next question. Are these items and are these examinations and tests identified in a particular way so that you know what case you're working on? Um, every case that comes into the laboratory, uh, yes, is designated with a laboratory case number that coincides with uh, whatever the police agency case number is. Thank you. Does this look like that document? 
Uh, yes, it does. The case number that's on here uh, corresponds to what I have um, in my notes and on my report. Now, does that document include both the, the firearm as usually identified on the screen as well as the magazine? It does, yes. Are they labeled in a particular way? Uh, I don't see any difference between the one. The, one is the firearm is listed as BML1 and the package with the magazine and the ammunition is BML1B. And those were two separate packages that came to you separately? That's correct. Do you recall if the magazine came loaded with ammunition? Uh, if I can consult my notes just to refresh my memory. Is your memory exhausted? Uh, no. Do you but. need to consult your notes to determine how many rounds of ammunition came with the package? Uh, it's not something I have committed to memory, but I do have notes on whether or not the magazine was loaded or if it was uh, unloaded at that time. Please consult your notes. Uh, yes, in this particular instance, the magazine was loaded and the, the four live rounds were uh, inside the magazine when I received it. And you previously testified that you tested that magazine for function, correct? Correct. The magazine functioned correctly, yes? Yes, it did. And when you use that ammunition to test the function of the firearm, um, it's fair to say that you used ammunition from the lab and not ammunition that was collected as evidence, correct? Correct. I use laboratory ammunition unless I absolutely need to use the evidence uh, ammunition. Okay. And so you unloaded the ammunition that came in that magazine and then tested that magazine, correct? Right. And then you would have preserved that ammunition as part of the evidence packet, correct? Uh, correct. Typically, I will place it into a small Ziploc bag and that goes back into the original packaging with the magazine. Okay. Um, you document your findings, correct? I do, yes. As a matter of fact, you just referenced um, in front of the jury that you, you take notes as a result of this. I do, yes. And it's good practice as a forensic examiner to take notes and to write everything down so that in case you have to testify in front of a jury, you have an opportunity to talk about the tests you did, uh, any values or data that you gathered, correct? Correct. Um, I want to take you very briefly through something called a firearm examination worksheet. Do you have that with your notes today? I do, yes. Okay. So very briefly, I want to take you through um, your firearm examination worksheet that you filled out. So just so that we're clear, um, the lab number that you have on your notes, is that L2301755? That's correct, it is. Okay. Um, and is that worksheet dated 41023? It is. Okay. Are those your initials in the top right-hand corner under examiner? Uh, yes, JRT. JRT, okay. Um, and again, the exhibit number, that matches the item that you believe you brought in for testing, correct? Um, I didn't bring it into the laboratory. It was submitted by police personnel, but uh, yes, BML1 is the exhibit on my worksheet. I yes. guess I should rephrase. When you accepted this item in for testing, is that the correct number? Uh, yes, it is, BML1. Um, and we've already identified that it came in this box. Um, was there anything else about the box? Was it sealed? Was it unsealed? Anything like that? Um, it was sealed with blue and red evidence tape. Uh, it, was, it was a typical gun box that firearms, handguns are typically submitted to and the laboratory. that's standard, in. correct? It is, yes. Um, and again, based upon your data and your observations, this is a Glock model handgun, correct? Uh, Glock is the make, yes. The, the specific model for this gun is the Model 17. Okay, and Glock makes a number of models, and you identified this as a Glock Model 17, correct? I did. Okay, and that's a caliber 9mm, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, now, the firearm has a serial number, correct? It does. And you documented that? I did. And that serial number is AFXE105? That's right. Now, <laughs> not all firearms have serial numbers, correct? But this one did. Most that are imported or created or manufactured in the United States do require to have a serial number on the frame of the firearm. And this one did have a, uh, a serial number on the frame. Right. So when a manufacturer creates a frame, right, when they create a firearm that functions, um, they have to submit certain documentation to the federal government. And that includes the serial number, correct? Uh, what sort of paperwork the manufacturers deal with and their how their information is submitted to the federal government is out of my area of expertise. I, I'm not aware of any of that um, type of information. The serial number, is that helped in tracing firearms? I believe it does, yes. Have you ever done a firearm trace? No, I have not. Have you ever seen a firearm trace? No, I have not. 
Now, you listed off a number of um, coursework, classes, certifications that you've taken um, as a firearm examiner as part of your career in education. Um, does any of that education deal specifically with, fi with Glock firearms? Uh, one of the courses that I've taken a number of years ago uh, was an armorer's course uh, that was per, uh, put on um, by Glock individual or folks that work for Glock. Okay, and have you taken any recent courses that deal with Glock firearms or Glock firearm manufacturing? Uh, no, I've not. I think, believe the class that I took was probably in 2006, if I remember correctly. You believe that that was the last time that you took a class on Glocks? Uh, I believe that was the only time I had taken an armorous course by Glock, yes. Okay. You didn't uh, attend a training called Manufacturing Methods of Glock Pistols in 2022? Uh, that was a webinar that was presented um, by my colleagues in the field um, on Glock pistols, and I was talking a little bit about, um, if I remember, again, if I remember correctly, about um, the way that their barrels are manufactured. Okay. Um, the state brought you through how this particular firearm functions, correct? Yes. Um, you talk a lot about the trigger safety, which is the, and you identified that on the image, and you stated that there are no other buttons or levers or anything else that could be called a safety on this particular firearm, correct? None on the external surfaces of it. There are two other safety features that are housed inside of the firearm that are not the, visible from the outside. And that's the firing pin block and the drop safety, correct? That's correct, yes. The drop safety is some kind of called a trigger bar safety, correct? I don't recall off the top of my head. I just know it as what Glock refers to it as the drop safety. Okay. Um, and all of these function to make sure that unless somebody pulls the trigger, the gun does not go off. Correct, yes. In pulling the trigger on a Glock pistol, that will disengage the trigger safety as well as the two internal ones, the drop safety and the firing pin safety. You conducted a, an examination of this particular Glock pistol with this serial number, and you found it to be functioning normally, correct? That's correct. You couldn't get it to go off by dropping it or striking it with a mallet or a hammer or anything like that, correct? That's right. No, it functioned normally as I would expect it to. And you tested and you recorded the data um, that this particular firearm has a trigger pull of approximately seven and a half pounds? Uh, seven to seven and a half pounds, yes. Um, and that's norm in the normal range for a Glock firearm? Uh, it's typical, yes. Okay. And you, beyond the fact that the firearm functioned when you tested it, um, did you disassemble the firearm to check the internal mechanisms of the firearm? No, I did not. Okay. Um, but you loaded it with a magazine, you brought it to a testing facility, you pulled the trigger, and it functioned properly, correct? Yes. When I test fired it the three times, um, I found that it operated without any type of malfunction. And again, you couldn't get it to malfunction by striking it, dropping it, or conducting any other tests like that, correct? Right. During that jar-off testing that I mentioned, um, where I use a basically a three-pound rubber mallet to uh, strike the firearm in a number of places to see if that action can cause the firing pin to move forward, uh, I found that it did not, um, it didn't fire whenever it was struck. So it passed that, um, that jar off test. So once an individual were to place a loaded magazine into this particular Glock firearm and pull back that slide, um, for lack of a better term, to make it ready to shoot, they need do nothing else but pull the trigger, correct? That's correct. No other manipulations of the item need to be made in order to fire it, correct? Right. Once a round has been chambered, meaning that, like you said, that slide moves forward, takes a live round of ammunition from the magazine and puts it into the chamber. At that point, the person could pull the trigger, which disengages those three safeties and the gun could fire. It's designed to work that way? Yes. It's a popular firearm, correct? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Glock firearms are used by police officers. Uh, I know that they are duty weapons for uh, a number of agencies. Is the Glock firearm something you can go down to a licensed federal dealer and buy as a civilian? Uh, I would imagine so, yes. Just a brief note with regards to the flashlight. Other than it being a flashlight or a laser, I think you described it as, does it modify or change the function of the item of the firearm or the handgun? 
Uh, no, I don't believe it does. In fact, when I go to test fire it, I typically take those off of the front end of the firearm so it'll fit into the port of the uh, shoot tank that I fire into. Now, you described for the state at length the difference between a semi-automatic firearm, a revolver, potentially a rifle, or a long gun, a handgun. Um, are there handguns that operate in different ways than a Glock handgun? Uh, if you're talking about, do you mean like the like the the type of operating system that, so, that uh, each uses, for example? I'll use language I think you're probably familiar with. The Glock firearm is considered a striker-fired firearm, correct? That's correct, There's yes. no external hammer on a Glock firearm, correct? That's right. So there's no hammer that a person could potentially pull back with their thumb or anything like that? Right. The firing pin or the striker is housed inside of the slide. No, there are, in fact, semi-automatic firearms that do have a hammer that can either be pulled back or operated by pulling a trigger, correct? That's right, yes, there are. Okay. Um, and those would have heavier or lighter trigger pulls based upon the design of those firearms, correct? Uh, that's true, yes. Depending on how those firearms operate, um, there could be a variety of trigger pull weights uh, for depending on how the firearm operates. And you would agree then that um, there are other handguns, there are other pistols that operate similarly to a Glock but have different features such as a hammer or an external safety or thing of that nature, correct? Yes, there are a variety of semi-automatic pistols that might operate a little bit differently but um, and have different features that make the gun function. And as the state had you um, testify to on direct, this firearm, you pull the trigger, it operates itself, correct? And it reloads for the next shot. It does, as long as there's um, ammunition in the magazine. And that's semi-automatic. That's the definition of semi-automatic. Correct. That each pull of the trigger will fire the gun. And you were you were particular about this, which is that the weapon will operate either until it runs out of ammunition or the person stops, correct? Uh, correct. With, um, with the magazine, if there's ammunition in it and you fire, you continue to fire by pulling the trigger. Um, yes, either you stop shooting or if you, if you run out of cartridges, um, yes. Okay. And Bringing you back, you this item came to the lab with a magazine that was submitted with it, correct? Yes, it was, packaged separately. Now, that magazine came in with the same incident number and the same lab number, correct? That's right. And that would lead you to believe that it was an item that was submitted or seized with this firearm, correct? Uh, I wasn't there to collect it. Uh, I don't go to scenes or anything like that. But the fact that it's the same case number, the submission numbers are similar in that one item is BML1, and then the package with the ammunition is BML1B. And do you recall, or can you describe for us, were there any markings on that magazine? Uh, there's manufacturing information that's stamped on there, yes. Okay, and do you recall with regards to this particular item that you examined, um, whether or not there was manufacturing information um, <clears throat> on the magazine, there was the make Glock as well as the Glock, the Glock logo, uh, what caliber it was, and then a series of numbers that I'm not quite sure what they were, but I noted that they were on the magazine. And it's fair to say that the magazine being marked Glock and this being a Glock firearm, that they're manufactured by the same company? I don't know if the magazines are all also made in Austria. I don't know the background of where the particular magazines are, but they're marked for Glock, and the magazine that I received was compatible with this Glock pistol. Okay. Um, do you recall what the magazine capacity was of this particular magazine? I do. It was marked 17. Okay. And you recall that there are four live 9mm cartridges in that magazine when, you, when it was submitted to you? That's correct. Okay. Um, and you said the capacity is 17? Yes. And so essentially the magazine came to you. I just want to be clear because I'm not sure that uh, I heard you say this. The magazine was loaded when you received it? And yes. You, and you had to unload it? Uh, correct. It was packaged inside of a uh, small manila envelope and the magazine in there did have four cartridges uh, that were in it. So when I conduct my examination, I take those live rounds out of the magazine. Okay. Um, 
as is the typical practice at your forensic laboratory. Um, was this submitted to you? Did you check it out of an evidence room? Could you walk us through that procedure? Uh, yes, typically when the item this, when the items are submitted to the laboratory, they are uh, brought to the main, the front desk of the laboratory, which is called evidence control. Um, at that point, it's typically brought in uh, by police personnel. The uh, person, the folks that work at the evidence control area will then check the items in and through our computer system, a, a set of barcode stickers is created that contains the laboratory case number as well as the police agency case number. Uh, the item number uh, or exhibit number, so in this case, BML1 and BML1B, and then a barcode. And that barcode is basically what tracks the item as it makes its way through the laboratory. So it was brought into the laboratory and it was checked in by the evidence control personnel and then put into a uh, storage area in the evidence control area. So when I'm ready to work the case, um, I will then request from the evidence control personnel the items related to this. So in this case, it was the gun in the magazine. Um, they let me know when they've retrieved it from storage. Uh, I will go up to the front counter and they will transfer those items to me. And that transaction is recorded in the computer system through um, scanning the, the barcode items as well as myself and the other person putting in pin numbers uh, to make that exchange. Um, so once I've done that, um, then I take the firearm to my work area and then I begin my examination. Okay. So at that point, it's in my it's in my custody. And once it's in your custody, and once you take it to your examination area, um, you take care to document everything, uh, well, anything you're examining, correct? Correct. Yes. And so you would have noted uh, again all the data that we already talked about: the model number, the manufacturer, the capacity of the magazine. All of those things are important, correct? Yes. All of that information about the gun is what I document in the including in my the fact that it came to you loaded, correct? The gun itself wasn't loaded. I, uh, I, I apologize, the magazine came to you loaded. The magazine did have ammunition in it, um, but at that point, the magazine and the firearm are separate, so packaged separately, and there's no issue of like uh, a loaded gun or anything like that coming in. Understood, and that's why they're separated, essentially, to keep them safe. But again, my question to you was that magazine was loaded as it came to you, correct? And you documented all that information? Yes, it was. I have no further questions for this witness, Judge. No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. All right, okay. you can step down. Thank you. Okay, uh, so this is a good time to break. So we will break for the day. We will resume tomorrow at 10 o'clock. So remember, um, don't watch the news, don't listen to the radio, don't read the paper. Um, see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. All rise, please.